Good morning to our wonderful crowd of data analytics, or data scientists, I should say, as well as guests. What we're looking at today, primarily this one graph right here, and you may recognize, these are each of the vaccines. This is reviewing the vaccine reaction database up to, or I should say from January 1st, 2021 to May 28th, 2021, where we have accumulated 252,521 vaccine adverse reaction reports. The proportion of those reports, as you see here, rest over here on the left side of the bar chart. And this is the accumulated number of each one of those vaccine adverse event reports based upon the vaccine that is out there. There's an interesting trend in reference to the Janssen vaccine, which we're going to look at in a second. Uh, but however, though, this is what we're looking at. And I'll keep in mind, too, just for those that are not aware, last week our channel was censored uh, due, to, due to the accusation of medical misinformation. But however, though, after the YouTube fact checkers went through the data, and we're going to go through the data. That's why we're going to go a little slower tonight. And I'm going to show you the data sources as we go along, just in case we have an individual or a guest that does not believe this information here. That 217,000 vaccine reactions are now reported. Uh, a lot of people rely on major media networks for their news, which the news is primarily more infotainment and all because they don't report it does not mean it does not happen. YouTube data checkers went through it and they found out that this does not violate the community guidelines. So thank you, YouTube, in reference to checking the facts and seeing that we were not, not factual. So to proceed as follows, what we're gonna be looking at is follows is this. So this is where 252,521. As compared to all of 2020, you're looking at this, this will give you a taste of the other graphs we're looking at. All of 2020, up to May 28th, 2021, the number of reactions reported. Needless to say, personally between you and I, and the rest of who are watching this YouTube channel, I believe the CDC itself if you look at the database right here, from 2020, 40 megabytes of data up to 168 megabytes of data, their, their investigators have, have to be totally, totally overwhelmed. They have so many reports coming in so fast, I don't know how they can even process uh, even part of the data. But we're going to look at the data in a second, at least in reference to the, the, the basically the symptoms that people are reporting in reference to the vaccine reports. Now, what the CDC did do as well is they started this list last week, which was wonderful. They compiled all of the data, meaning someone at the CDC is making it easy for data scientists, engineers, analysts, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, you name it to go through here and start drawing comparisons between prior vaccines and vaccines now. So you have to put a feather in the cap of the CDC data analytic or data engineer who did that. Our vaccine or various reports are all the way up to May 21st, 2021, even though I said up to May 28th, that's the updated time. You'll see what I mean in a second. But now let us get right into the primary research articles this one is developing a lot of traction, and you're probably not going to hear about it that much. I think I heard a little bit of mention in the news, but however, those just we're going to go into a little more detail. Mass mandates in use are not associated with slower state level COVID 19 spread during the COVID 19 growth surges. Containment requires future research, like, for example, we discussed UVC, ozone, oxygen, you know, and so forth, other mitigation strategies. And now, does it mean mass does not work in a controlled setting. That's the problem. But like the Denmas study brought to our attention, uh, and also what researchers noted in the very beginning, in a real world setting, uh, mask use as far as not fitting well, remember people touching their face, remember how that faded, then double masking, triple masking, uh, wearing space helmets, you know how it began to unfold. But they're saying, they're not taking the, the COVID-19 lightly. 
they're, what they're implying is basically it'd be better to pursue other mitigation efforts. And if we go into the research that they utilized here, uh, but that's right here, as you can see. Oh, well, let's look at this chart. Let's close this out. I'll have the link to the full text, which is wonderful. It's all laid out to be reviewed, peer reviewed. And basically the exact same thing. You go through the abstract, the introduction. Uh, they went through quite detailed. Remember, this is collecting data. It's not necessarily a study itself. It is, it is the data of the results of basically mask wearing and not mask wearing in a real world setting. You look at it primarily heavily as far as observation is concerned. And it's the same thing that we've concluded too by looking at our data. When we kept on looking at states when they started opening up and having controls, we all of a sudden had states that were not wearing masks. For the longest period of time, Sweden was our only control that we had as a country not wearing a mask to see exactly what was happening. And of course, we know what happened in Sweden. They did have a little bit of a surge towards the end. They went to a mass level two. But in reality, uh, it basically didn't seem to make a difference in the end. So here we go. Uh, and there's maybe a reason for that. We're going to look at that in a second too. So wonderful, wonderful data. Let's give you a little a large section right here. You can see how they broke through everything. So it's just not, what I'm doing is I'm trying to show you it's not just conjecture. That is actually well laid out in a very statistical, uh, a nice statistical manner where anybody else could look at the data, look at the math, and make an opinion, either criticize or, or basically acknowledge in reference to what is the outcome as far as the research is there, uh, as opposed to basically relying upon infotainment is what I call it the news and they went through it quite well uh the, the dive or spinner mask the summer the whole lineup uh and it, it came to that one last conclusion that basically it did not appear again no one likes to speak in absolutes when it comes to science and anybody that does speak in absolutes like saying the science is settled really misses the whole ball game in reference to what science really is it's always asking why, 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 why. Four-year-olds make the best scientists. So outside of scientific method, at least they have the right, you know, emotional mentality in reference to why. So mass mandates were not associated with slower state level COVID-19 spread during the COVID-19 growth services. And so the links will be there for you as you see. And now the next part. Now this blows a hole in the vaccine mandates and passports because the, the assumption in reference to the vaccine was that there was no long-term natural immunity. Well, here we go. Again, everything will be footnoted as those fact checkers out there like to review through the channel. So you can all link to it and basically validate what I'm saying is what other researchers have determined in reference to their outcome. Henceforth, I am not going to be adding a lot of publisher bias because publisher bias, for those not familiar, is me coming up with conjecture. And that's how this whole COVID-19 uh, trauma began, not just about people getting sick, but necessarily the draconian measures, which obviously, uh, from a science standpoint, appear not to be efficacious. But here we go. Good news. Mild COVID-19 induces long-lasting antibody protection. I'm just going to narrate through it. Last fall, the reports that antibodies wane quickly after infection with the virus that causes COVID-19. Remember, everyone's learning. It's a learning curve. And mainstream media interpreted that mainstream media. And it's worth, I don't call it mainstream media, media anymore myself. I call it infotainment. I encourage you to reference it as infotainment as well because it changes our perception. Interpreted that to mean that immunity was not long lived. Abedadadadada said, Ali Alabedi, please forgive me if I mispronounce, but that is a misinterpretation of the data. It's normal for antibody levels to go down after acute infection, but they don't go down to zero. They plateau. You see it? They saw the antibody levels go down. They drew conjecture. And therefore, what these researchers are here to do from the Washington University School of Medicine is to explain what actually happens. 
Here we found antibody-producing cells in, 11, in people 11 months after first symptoms. These cells will live long and produce antibodies for the rest of people's lives. That's strong evidence for long-lasting immunity. Now, the next question. If natural exposure can basically give that type of protection in people's lives for their entire life, will an inoculation do the same thing? Or would an mRNA experimental vaccine do the same thing? So now that's a big question, especially if an individual is exposed to COVID-19 while they're healthy and young. And that can give them lifelong protection. As opposed to starting now when they're healthy and young, this process of vaccination and never having a natural exposure. Interesting question. All right, now, to confirm the data, which is interesting because everything seems to want to range of pores, and this is in a good way, uh, is another one right here. COVID-19 infections were high among hospital staff, but reinfection rates are very low. So what we're looking at here is the information is coming out from different aspects or different venues. So you have the European Lung Foundation now come out with a study that basically is parallel but similar to basically Washington University School of Medicine. And what did they conclude? It says, we continued to monitor staff for the seven months and found that having a positive antibody test gave 85% protection against future infection. This is really good news for people who have already had COVID-19 as it means the chances of a second infection are very low. Again, links will be there for you to follow. Obviously, I am not here to be believed. I am not here. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the, the fact that I have an opportunity to review the research, which a lot of individuals do not. And, you know, you can always make the argument for selection bias. You know, so be it. But however, though, uh, you don't see this selection bias, at least uh, in our infotainment channels. And it would be nice to have at least some science. It's actually science science as opposed like from the European Lung Foundation. Infection, European Lung Foundation, please forgive me. Actually make it to the public to give a chance of some hope. People see this as the opportunity for freedom or, or freedom from, you know, misguided uh, bureaucrats who just happen to be in a chronic state of emergency. All right, next. To confirmation now of this one and confirmation of this one. Here we go. Journal of American Medical Association. Assessment to SARS-CoV-2 reinfection one year after primary infection in a population in Lombardy, Italy. What was the conclusion? Discussion. The study, res the study results suggest that reinfections are rare events and patients who have recovered from COVID-19 have a lower risk of reinfection. Natural immunity SARS-CoV-2 appears to confer a protective effect for at least a year, which is similar to, to the protection report in vaccine studies, both without the vaccine. However, the observation ended before SARS-CoV-2 began to spread. So again, they're saying, at least with the current variants that they utilized here. And now keep in mind also too, there's a parallel. The vaccines, were developed most of them off the original variant. Everything else that you see does it protect against this variant or that variant is post-marketing analysis. So they're dealing with apples and apples in reference to vaccine and naturally acquired immunity. But however, though, we have a confirmation. We now have a confirmation. I can't say it's causative, but you can see how it's all coming together. Reinfection after one year, rare. Infections high among hospital staff, reinfection rates are very low. Good news, mild COVID-19 lasting antibody protection. Washington University School of Medicine, European Lung Foundation, and Journal of American Medical Association. There you have three confirming aspects that came out in the exact same week, which is last week. So let us proceed to the next one. This is on the negative slant. How independent were US and British vaccine advisory committees? The link will be there. But as you read through it, the British Medical Journal came to conclusion. Remember, they were the ones that exposed the World Health Organization over the SARS-CoV-1 
in reference to conflicts of interest? Well, history tends to repeat. This little caveat, I want to give you towards the end of this, basically this article, which you already tell it where it's going. There obviously is conflicts. There are reported conflicts of interest, which were not disclosed. So when you look at the general public, why would you have the faith in reference to a vaccine, a medical procedure, or pandemic mitigation strategy if the people which are in control of basically dictating policy, research, so on and so forth, are not honest. But yet you want an individual to take their medical advice. But they're not honest. You see what I mean? That creates a bullying conflict. And so, you know, often we talk about political transparency. Well, obviously you have a lot of pandemic mitigation strategies, which, you know, from the very beginning, when we started looking at it 33 weeks ago, were highly in question, and they had a very cavalier attitude to it, which was probably the wrong route to go, because when the next pandemic hits, which eventually there will be one, uh, you're going to have people which are a lot less likely to comply if they feel like there's a lack of trust. But here we go. Let's go to the aspect here. That's publisher bias. That's an example. That's my story time publisher bias. I won't do it for a little while longer. But this is an interesting aspect of British Medical Journal when they queried one of the people, individuals. Quote, he agrees that a standardized universal disclosure form make compliance easier for people and help avoid confusion about which financial matters should be disclosed and what the institution should make public. People can legitimately follow whatever rules they encounter, but important things may still get left out, he explains. The British Medical Journal's investigation also uncovered close ties between a leading medical journal and the FDA's authorization process. Remember, we're talking the COVID vaccines. So to reiterate, the British Medical Journal investigation uncovered close ties between a leading medical journal and the FDA's authorization process. The editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, I'm not going to say the individual's name, sat on the authorization panels for and voted to recommend authorizing the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines. Pfizer and Moderna subsequently published their clinical trials in da, 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 the New England Journal of Medicine. Yet, this individual declared no conflicts of interest to all three vaccine panels. So, this is the individual you want to trust the future livelihood of your children to. Is it? So, I want to read that again. The editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine... You see his name there. I'm not saying it for legal reasons. Sat on the authorization panels for and voted to recommend authorizing Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines. In a strange twist of events, Pfizer and Moderna subsequently published their clinical trials in the New England Journal of Medicine. Remember that article that we did last uh, week in reference to vaccines in nursing homes? How we actually looked at the data we referenced that the people that were unvaccinated actually tend to do better than those that were vaccinated in the trials, but it didn't say that in the forward of the research. Quote, yet, blah, 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 declared no conflict of interest to all three vaccine panels. Just for you to think about it. If you want to review last week's uh, video where we covered that, look at that study in reference to the nursing homes. That was from the New England Journal of Medicine. Read the forward to that research and read and then review the data that we looked at last week on the outcomes, and it'll, it'll give you food for thought. Ask, here, here it comes. This is the cavalier, cavalier attitude that was presented. So asked by the British Medical Journal whether he recused himself from the decisions on the New England Journal uh, uh, Medicine submissions, he said, quote, overall, we consider the deep involvement of editors in the medical and research communities to be a strength, not a problem. Yep, see absolutely no problem there either. But again, that's what I'm talking about transparency medical decisions. It's for someone to be authorizing use of certain vaccines, how can it be a conflict of interest? I mean, you have to, we have to have like, for example, in the future, if this occurs again, an independent panel of all financial interests, like a Supreme Court, for example, uh, anything that's better than this, anything. I mean, seriously, 
anything. Probably be better if you asked your neighbor advice in reference to pandemic mitigation strategy as opposed to individuals which have financial conflicts of interest that just happen to be in such an incredible amount of uh, – uh, in a position of incredible authority like a feudal lord. But you see what I mean. Proceed as follows. Publish your bias once again. All right, here we go. This is important to in reference to. I'm going to include this one in here, even though it's uh, it's important to the individuals which have immunocompromised methotrexate. All right, I'm going to link the research here as well, because the reason this is important is because a third of the patients take methotrexate, a common treatment for immune mediated infl inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and cirrhotic arthritis fail to achieve an adequate immune response to the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, in a small study. So here you have your vaccine passports and elements like that. And you could have individuals who are immunocompromised uh, be vaccinated with the mRNA vaccines and not achieve an adequate, basically adequate immune response, at least not enough to stop transmission. And then they travel and everything else like that. But however, though, with that false sense of security, because they have their COVID passport, uh, you know, you already can see the problem. And vaccine passports, it, you know, obviously if you travel, you have to get vaccinated to go in a lot of countries to begin with. But, you know, it, it's, it's superfluous. And all it is is basically we either conforming to the policy forcefully or voluntarily but regardless of that, it is more dangerous to believe a policy like a vaccine passport works than to at least recognize that it may not. Because if your true intention is to stop uh, possibly the transmission of a future contagion, then you better come up with a better policy. Otherwise, giving people a false impression, all you're doing is really just showing that you're compliant, and that is it. All right, next, especially, or, you know, whatever. It's better if your person was it had a natural exposure, obviously, to these first three studies, you know, as opposed to get a vaccine. For example, this poor individual, here's a person who probably thinks they're protected against SARS-CoV-2. So one third of the individuals to get immunocompromised medication under the false impression. Wouldn't it be better to be honest and say, hey, if you're feeling, if you're around someone that's sick, whatever it is, don't take the vaccine for granted. You know, you may want to, you know, stay a little distant, avoid, you know, avoid less time in that room. Anything you could do to reverse, uh, reduce what's called the viral load. Probably one of the biggest indicators uh, in reference to this whole pandemic thing. It's all down to reducing viral load. But however, though, ironically, if you're exposed to a small amount of the virus and then you you walk away and first vice versa, as we discussed last week, they found out that it actually helps strengthen the immune system to whatever that potential vector, viral vector is. But next, physical activity. This is an important one, an important one, because the long-term outcome and just is more trivia, but here we go. Ready? The results show drastic reductions in physical activity and well-being says Wilkie. Uh, more than two-thirds of those questions were unable to maintain their usual level of activity. Moderate exercise decreased by an average of 41%. And that's self-reported. And you know self-reported data tends to have a bias to go in the other way. This includes anything that increases heart rate and breathing, such as brisk walking, running, cycling, or even strenuous gardening. 41% decrease. And the mental health, another part of the study team's authors asked about the mental well being during the pandemic restrictions. 73%. This is part of the collateral damage due to draconian pandemic mitigation strategies, which are not science. They're, most of them are based upon weaponizing uncertainty, superstition, and again, I'd rather watch TikTok to get my news than just listen to half the bureaucrats uh, sitting in the governor's seats in most of these states. Uh, which measures mood, relaxation, da da da, uh, dropped from an average of 68% before the pandemic to 52% in the first lockdown phase. Uh, people felt less active and full of energy and led a life less filled with interesting things. That says a lot. 
And again, I think that's why a lot of people are suffering from what I call Stockholm Syndrome. They're not really questioning the authority of those which are basically claiming authority. Uh, they're basically saying, well, once the mask mandate is lifted or they don't have to do this or do that, they're actually thankful towards their um, captors. Is that a word? Uh, so to say. Uh, then more than when they actually should be angry about false imprisonment. And looking at the data that you and I have been reviewing for quite some time, yeah, it's pretty much false imprisonment. Uh, especially if they're, if they're supposed to be following the science, even if it's questionable, 50 50. You know, self determination, freedom, and mental well being should always be the priority. And so now we're going to go to the next two wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to skim through them real fast. Uh, drug research. Yeah, I like vitamins and nutrients and things like that, but still, more than anything else, Number one is let's just keep people alive and healthy. This one's a cool one. Uh, this is called PIN21. Again, I'll have the link there as well. Uh, this is actually interesting because PIN21 is actually Pittsburgh inhaled nanobody 21. All right, but here we go. By using inhalation therapy, they can directly minister to the infection site, the respiratory tract and lungs, we make treatment more, more efficient says, we are very excited to be encouraged uh, by the data suggests that PIN20 is going to be high protective against severe disease and can potentially prevent human-to-human -human viral transmission. Now, where it came down to, here it is. This is what I want to find brief for you. Even more impressively, inhalation of aerosol nanobodies at ultra-low dose reduced the number of infection, infectious virus particles in the lung tissue by six logs or a million fold. Animals who received aerosolized PIN21, nanobodies had milder changes in the lung structure and a low degree of inflammation than those who received the placebo. Wonderful, cool little breakthrough because again, it's simple. It, it's not trying to change the biology of an individual through an inoculation uh, per se. And it's, it's efficacious. Another one that came through from actually this was from Pittsburgh. Remember Pittsburgh inhalable nanobody 21. This is from Penn researchers called Diabsi, uh, which activates the body's innate immune system was highly effective in preventing severe COVID-19 in mice. They were infected with SARS-CoV-2, according to scientists from Perlman School of Medicine, the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. The findings published this month in Science. Blah, 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 could also treat other corona, uh, respiratory, or respiratory coronaviruses, which is important because people worry about uh, the mutations. Few drugs have been identified as game changers in blocking SARS-CoV-2 infection. This paper is the first to show that activating an early immune response therapeutically with a single dose, a single dose. So you see what I mean? If you're in a position, let's say, for example, let's say someone traveled on an airliner. And then you get a call, you know, maybe a few days later, uh, while it's still an incubation period going on, that someone on the plane had a um, Marburg or, for example, SARS-CoV-1 uh, or something like the Marburg. MERS, Marburg, now we're going to be back to fetal viruses. We're going to talk about Ebola. That's a whole different ballgame. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, a single, you know, let's say um, MERS or SARS-CoV-1 or SARS or some sort of like a, uh, common cold variant and they go wow boom and here it is and they just say take take this single dose thing and help control the virus that is elegant beautiful and that's where i like to see us head is basically looking at that and it's a little reactionary but you know what it's better than having to maintain a chronic state of inoculation you see where i'm going with that and where a person can develop their natural immunity to the highest level in the environment in which they must exist and then take something like this in case there's a breakthrough. So that's a real important thing. Now people are going to, I know also too, they're looking at this uh, coronavirus and you'll also hear this argument reference to, and I'm going to go a little bit off course here, but you'll see where I'm going, that, that basically people think that the mask has stopped influenza and as well as helping their, keep them healthy. And that is an interesting perspective, but more likely, and I could be wrong, but I'm not 
I do not mind being challenged or confirmed in reference to this. There's something called viral pathogen replacement. There's a reason you only have so many influenza viruses at one time in the environment. So people are in the false impression that by having the coronavirus out there and wearing a mask and distancing and sanitizing and everything else like that, that at the same time, it's also killing off the influenza virus. Viral pathogen replacement. And that's important because when you look at medicines or treatments like this, you can't, if you continue to vaccinate against something continuously and then something else comes along, you know, who knows? The coronavirus is for whatever could be holding back something even more lethal. You know, for example, that was what they're concerned about when they started doing a lot of other vaccinations, that it would change the dynamic and viral pathogen replacement would take place with another type of more deadly disease. That may be happening with whooping cough or pertussis, for example. But in this case, you know what I mean? You allow things to evolve naturally. And if there's a breakthrough or problem uh, in reference to the integrity of your pandemic mitigation strategy overall, while people can still live and enjoy their life, boom, you have something like this ready to go. Beautiful way of going. All right, now let's begin with the data research as follows. And here we go. Do, do, do. Well, we're going to review the various database. And just to reiterate, all right, we are looking at this is what we're doing. Now, I'm going to go through a little detail. This is going to help the YouTube people so we don't get um, honestly shot down from uh, misinformation or report from misinformation once again. Uh, we're looking at the VARES, the VARES database as such right here. We're pulling our data down right here. And we're, then we're combining our databases. And so I'm what's called merging them, not familiar. All right, there's our information, information. You don't have to pay attention to that if you're not familiar. I'm just doing it for that sake. Let's start with the generalized vaccine reports. As you see here, boom, we covered that right from the beginning. All right, now what we're going to be looking at, I want to put you on a, on a pause this for a second. We'll be right back in a second. And I'm back. If you just in case you see the clock jump ahead by any second, it's not because it's a glitch. It's just me at the pause for a second. Here we go. Covine, Covine. COVID re vaccine reactions ports by age. This is what we're going to do. We're going to be breaking it down a little bit so we can do a little bit of research. All right. Now, this is as of, uh, remember, it's May 21st, but the VAERS data reporting system was, again, May 28th. But it's data process is May 21st. I'm just, these guys have got to be working their butts off because that is a tremendous amount of data to go through and compile. But here we are. This is what we're looking at. Vaccine reports for age. Look at the you know, the statisticians out there are going to be noticing, a, you know, this bell curve going on, a normalization of data. But we're looking at is age groups: 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 30 to 35, 40 to 45, so on and so on and so forth, which may be pretty representative of the population. And look at that large amount between 15 and 20 within a short period of time. You see what I mean? And Again, if you're above 100, you don't get a get out of vaccine free card. It looks like, but here we are. Now you normally would think we have a lot here. These are reactions. Keep in mind, this is reactions. And the part that's interesting in reference to the reactions. Now again, it could be percentage issue because we could be more people being vaccinated at a certain age, so on and so forth. So there could be a lot of confounding factors. But you expect the young and healthy, for example, would have. A far less reactions as opposed to the older generations. But look at how uniform that is. We could work out the percentages later on, but still that that's that's intriguing. But to proceed, deaths by age. All right, I didn't see an increase in deaths I'll have to look at last week's, but as far as that, we now have 4,227 reported vaccine deaths by age. What is fake news? What is false news? is when infotainment uh, makes the claims that everything's perfectly safe. No, that's not science. Bad, bad TV channels, bad. What it means is the risk to benefit ratio. The question is, yes, you're gonna have fatalities, but are you having far less fatalities? Doesn't that sound freaking cold? Shouldn't that be a person's choice, you know, what they wanna do, what they don't? 
instead of doing their patriotic duty, apparently by getting a vaccine, it appears. That's not my call. That's your call. But, you know, if the vaccine was better studied, I'd, I'd feel less reluctancy. You know, if the people were more honest in reference to conflicts of interest, I'd feel even better. Um, you know, it's like the tetanus shot. You know, people, it's really weird. People don't ever associate that per se. People will get a tetanus shot in a heartbeat. You know, they can be totally anti-vaccine. You see where I'm going? But a tetanus shot, because the way it sounds, no problem. But here you have, look at here, 4,227 vaccine-related deaths reported. They have to be validated. But still, that's odd. And then uh, I started noticing right here, you see this age is right there, 0.42. That's really weird. Those little outliers way out there, 15, 16, 17, 18. We're going to look at the deaths beginning to uh, be compiled from this age on in the minors in a second. But that 0.42, that one right there, that's a five-month-old. And the problem with the CDC is they really need a lot of extra funding to go through the vaccine adverse event reports because they're coming in super fast. 217,000 last week, 252,000 this week, seven days. Think about that. But this one right here, we're going to look at that in a few seconds. All right. COVID vaccine reaction reports by day of the week. And here we are. Again, validation of data. This is basically looking at a rolling seven. Uh, looks scarier. If I was to show you this, it's actually legitimate. But however, though, it would have more of a uh, impact psychologically, which would not be fair to representation of the data. So that's like every week. All right. Now here's a symptom text. So we're breaking down, just showing this to basically look at things. This is the head of our data, per se, symptom text, so on and so forth, illnesses. And you, people can see how long this merged data frame is. Again, that's prim primarily for the fact checkers. Um, this is the columns that we're utilizing. Again, we're going through a little more detail. Again, this is for the fact checkers, uh, per se. Da -da -da, da -da -da. All right. And then this one right here, as far as data, again, this is 2021, all the vaccine reaction reports. Again, it could be psychological aspect to this, whatever it is comes down to be. But you know what's interesting is we had, you know, from 217 to 252 for one week, the people now which are getting vaccinated uh, are more reluctant and they're being kind of coerced. So chances are you're going to have a lower percentage of people being vaccinated, but a higher percentage of reports because they're either angry or suspicious. So you see how that can play a role too. But here we are. That was a massive jump between here and here. We're only talking seven days. So within seven days, you almost covered the. You almost covered. I shouldn't say, but it's an exaggeration. But in one week of vaccinating with the COVID vaccines, you almost began to jump at least at least over half of all of 2020. Seven days, half of 2020, at least. Think about that. All right. This is our basically looking at the data here. All right. This is interesting here. I want to start breaking down. This is why I wanted to break it down for the kids. And or we should utilize the minors. Uh, you notice a lot of, you look at the symptoms, the reports, chest pains, uh, cardiac arrest, death. Uh, a lot of times you're going to, let's, let's, let's move this a little over, over here. No names are here, so that everyone's protected. Uh, you start seeing a lot of either heart, you see the patterns, a lot of cardiac arrest, and you know, a lot of suicides. Not a lot overall, but as far as the reports are concerned, the very few which are there, um, you got to pause it. I mean, it's, uh, seriously, you just got to... This, this is a little disturbing. If you look at the ages, too. Uh, 21, 21, 17, 15, 16, 0. 0.42. All right, that 0. 0.42. Now, let's look at this, right? That is VARES ID 11660062. Here we go. And this is heartbreaking. I mean, I've, I've, I mean, seriously, 
you read through these symptoms and the pain that people have, I mean, you develop an empathy. I mean, you could see how an entire nation could develop empathy to the unjust death of one individual. You start reading through these reports, and if you're not touched, then you, you've got to be a machine. But here we go. Let's look right here. 116-0062. There's the patient age, 0.42. This is a warning flag to me, a massive warning flag. And these are the cases that need to be investigated immediately to either confirm or deny the fact that this reaction report could actually occur. All right. Sex male. That's because it's a child. All right. Person was vaccine was administered by work. If you're an employer, this is something you have to think about too. Because I don't know if you're liable for forcing an employee to be vaccinated. But this is pretty, pretty sad. All right. This is the symptoms. And you see right here, this is what gets your attention. Exposure via breast milk. All right. I'm not going to add publisher bias, okay? Uh, you take it from here. But we're going to read the adverse event description. Patient received second dose of Pfizer vaccine on March 17, 2020, while at work. March 18, 2020, her five-month-old. Remember, this is about a year ago. And I'm not seeing any any confirmation. Uh, one with the other, all right? Uh, her five-month-old breastfed infant developed a rash. And within 24 hours, let's read it here, the 24 hours was inconsolable, refused to eat, and developed a fever. Patient brought baby to local ER where assessment was performed. Blood analysis revealed elevated liver enzymes. Elevated liver enzymes. MicroRNA. What happens if the vaccine, all right, let's draw a strong correlation here without adding publisher bias. And this is pure conjecture. Remember the, the lipid envelope, that mRNA is there. What happens when that mRNA is brought at room temperature? All right. Now you vaccinate an individual and body temperature. Then that individual breastfeeds. Food for thought. Patient brought the baby to local ER where it performed blood analysis to reveal elevated liver enzymes. Infant was hospitalized but continued to decline and passed away. Diagnosis of TTT, no known allergies, no new exposure aside from mother's vaccination the previous day. Let's rest on that. All right, here we go. Next down the dial, you start seeing right here. Again, the ages are starting to be a little younger. You may see other, you know, other current illnesses and so on and so forth. Uh, but however, though, you start seeing that there is possibly a pattern here, uh, even though some of the reports are not exactly uh, accurately written per se. Uh, but you know, obviously, symptom one is an autopsy. But we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so here's our symptom text. All right, this way, if you wanted to read symptoms, remember we went through that before. Um, also, too, let me see one thing real fast. Now we'll get to that in a second. All right, let's go here. Now this is what's called a word cloud. Word clouds they can add, they can add a, a, a little bit of confounding and bias, but they're real good as far as basically just looking at what the problems are. This is the vaccine reactions in a word cloud among everything. All right, let's see if I can back this up a little bit. Oops, there we go. I'm trying to get the whole thing in there. All right, you see there? Now, you look at that for a second. Those are your most common reactions to vaccines. Uh, that's for the whole general populace. So that is to help it stands out. Like, for example, temperature increase, heart rate, feeling abnormal, pain, paroxysia. You know, you see all the way down the line. That's shortly after getting the vaccines. Those are the vaccine reactions being reported most often. All right, let's proceed down. Now, I broke it down this way. Let's pick this back up again. All right, let's see. Here we go. Top 30 reported symptoms. This is interesting. All right. And then you go all the way down the line. Obviously, now, this, this doesn't mean it's, not, it's the only symptom. This could often be in combination with something. But currently, as of March 21st, 
this information compiled on March 28th. As we go through and break down the words in each report as far as the symptoms, this is what we're having. All right. And you could pause this, look at that, and you can see the symptoms. Here's our words, the value counts, sort counts, again, for fact checkers, so on and so forth. That's broken down. If you want to check out the data that's performed, there it is. All right, here we go. COVID, COVID. COVID vaccine react. See, I'm trying to combine the words in my head to see how I'm thinking. COVID vaccine reaction reports by age, minors. All right, I cut this off. Now, for those not familiar, that's 18 and younger, it just means less than 19. So it's not including 19. All right, so basically, here we are. That's by age. See vaccine reactions, or some of this I still think has to be false reports, but again, that 0.42, for example, uh, some of them are not, and I, and I don't know why. But you're going to find out in a second, too, a lot of people are having their kids vaccinated below the age when they're supposed to be vaccinated because they're afraid. But here we go, most likely. That's me adding my bias, but still. These are vaccine reactions by age. Here we are. Uh, COVID vaccine, vaccine reaction reports by day and week, and this is minors, again, starting from January 1st. So you notice right here, it started quite some time ago, before a lot of the media came out with it. And that's the receive date, and that's up to now. The uh, purple line is your is your average, but then we don't have to look at that for now. All right, here we are. These are the symptoms, and now, you ready for this? Check this out. All right. Look at the, this is the tail. I'm only doing the last 15 columns. We could do more, but for now, I'm just doing the last 15 columns. You notice a commonality between all the adverse event reports. And this is random. This is, the, this is the bottom of the data set, meaning it's the bottom of the report. It's not like it's compiled per or type of vaccine. Look at your states. All right, you see right here, often mistakenly administered, uh, was administered instead of the Pfizer. Now, this is weird because this is just purely random. Uh, with a wrong age, uh, not indicated for under 18, uh, received the vaccine, Janssen. All these people are getting the vaccine when they're too young to be getting that particular vaccine. And what vaccine is it? Now, I would could believe that if it was one, if it wasn't the same freaking day in different states, what is, I mean, obviously a lot of people are going to vaccinate, but, but seriously, how, how many people are, how many people are administering these vaccines know what the heck they're doing? It's not so much the fact is, are the administrator the jack, the, I mean, <laughs> there are reactions to it as well. What the heck? So it's not so much the fact that even administering, the people administering the vaccine don't even know which vaccine they're administering to whom. That's not, that's not exactly a vote of confidence. All right, we're running really short on time here. I have to move, move a little forward here. Here's the word cloud in reference to, uh, let's make this a little smaller again. All right, word cloud, a reference to basically um, uh, children, the, what they report, in reference to the VAERS reports. And again, this is the most common, the common uh, complaints. And let's bring it back up again. Then breaking down a little easier way to read. This is what they're experiencing, uh, the youth. Uh, reference to the top 30 sim uh, symptoms. Some of them are not symptoms, but I left it in here anyways because you could tell exactly what they're looking for um, in reference to basically what they're experiencing. A little different trend in reference to the adults. So just something to keep in mind. All right, and then down the line, all right, let's get right into the data. But again, we'll review next week as well too uh, just to see exactly what uh, trajectory we're on uh, to see if there's additional growth. Uh, and maybe next week too, I'll be able to compare uh, as a percentage wise prior years. Uh, reference to this year, reference to see if there's any abnormality. 
uh, or if it's pretty much, um, you know, just such a high percentage of people being vaccinated uh, that it's, it's, it's skewing the results. So we'll look at the data next week in reference to that. But again, uh, it's, that's, it's still, it's hard to read. I mean, if, if, if your boss wants to mandate a vaccine to you or whatever, I really, really would recommend them go to this, the VAERS event details and read what people are writing down and experiencing before they start mandating something that's experimental. It's freaking experimental. How can you mandate an experimental medication to, to in order to, to go shopping or go to a movie theater or even freaking work? I can understand one that's been tested well, you know, but how are though in basically a difficult environment? But this is experimental. And that's not cool. So let's go next one. Let's go, go to the research. I'm going to go real fast. Here we go. Ready? All right. Let's look at the Monte Carlo. Ba-bam. Monte Carlo predicts uh, our iterations that if we continue at this current pace, deaths would be pretty low. Uh, cases per million are also heading down. If we go back to October 25th, this is our our machine model uh, for as far as predictions. All right, then we go to World Audit. Let's see what we have here. All right, I'm going to look at... Da, da, da. All right, that was our mask use. Here is our... We're looking at new cases smooth within a short period of time. We notice that massive drop again. That's the whole world dropping pretty fast as far as the cases. Uh, I know people what to do is you know how the media works. They'll use selection bias. They'll pick like one country that or that's having a problem, uh, and they'll bounce around from Vietnam to India to Brazil, which they do are having problems. But however, they're still just the same. But however, they don't tell you what's going on overall. Again, that controls the argument. Uh, let's see if we're all down. Mortality, 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 mortality. Da, 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 da. Oh, here we are. Here's Asia, right there. Look how fast it drops. It's just like, again, it's just dropping fast. Before last week, I thought that was an anomaly. It's going down pretty fast. And that's compared to the rest of the world. But however, though, look at that. Phew. Plummet. That's freaking insane. And uh, Africa did the same thing. So, you know, look at this. Again, I don't know if it's a timing issue or what, but that's just, it's an it's interesting ask, uh Observation. The world mass thing, da, 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 yeah, uh, Oxford University, which other source is not getting, doing anything, but let's go to India. All right, Sweden's going down, da, 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 Brazil down, da, da, da. Uh, their cases are up, um, but how are they pretty much the same, it seems like? Japan, again, I know more people look at the Olympics, but look, this is Japan. All right, whatever, you, you know, take it for what it's worth. New Zealand, you know, Finland, I want to go to India, India. Now look at this, deaths are beginning to decline slightly, cases, see how it peaked? Then almost the exact same thing. It would look like if you, if you take these peaks and you do, if you break up a normalized bell curve, you look for standard deviations, they're almost symmetrical. And that's the weird part about it. They're almost symmetrical. And uh, this is the, the reds are tests per thousand. See, the tests are going up, but the cases are going down. You see, you could, you could break that down and build a really strong machine model. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, do, do, do hospital occupancy, down to pass that one for today. Uh, this one, I did I even run this one. I want to come back to this one real fast. This is going to give us a percentage of the vaccine should be being distributed. All right, but we're not going to wait for it. We'll come back to it. All right. Let's look at our states. All right, here, keep in mind. There are only a few states left with mass mandates. A lot of them different vaccination policies, but here's our states remaining. And the reason we're going to back, go backwards here is because we're looking for this massive outbreaks. But look at the, the areas. Look at the drops. No matter what they do, makes no difference. They all go down the same. That's why the guy, when the guys are gals or other, when they did the research in reference to masks in the real world and correlations, remember we just read the first one off? Right there. Our data supports their data as far as observation. The one that you and I have been looking at from the very beginning. It's like there. And then we go here. And we go da 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 da. That's look at all going down the exact same time. 
these were Michigan, remember, was, was skyrocketing. His neighboring states, Wisconsin, remember Wisconsin, was bordered by two states which were like raving with COVID cases. Wisconsin just was Wisconsin. And here it is, remember, Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, there it is, hospitalizations. Minnesota, remember they were like there. And all these states right here, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, had no mask mandates. And they all did better than Minnesota. But look at this. They all declined at the same time. No matter what the pandemic mitigation strategy, no matter what it is, it seems like it just doesn't make a difference if it's on its own path. Uh, there's the thing. And let's see, anything else? There's a lot of data, which looks really, really cool. And we already know that the no mass states were doing better than the mass states. But uh, there's only a few uh, mass mandate states remaining, and they just haven't got on board with the science. All right, let's keep on going. Uh, da -da -da, vaccine effectiveness, VAERS, hospital occupancy. Let's see if this came through. Do -do 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 -do. There we are. Uh, that's our vaccine data. Uh, that's our distribution. Janssen, which obviously they're mistakenly uh, vaccinating a lot of the minors with. Oh, Freaking odd. I mean, dude, that's just, to me, it's just, it's bizarre. Moderna and then the Pfizer. And you can see the breakdown according to all of them right there. All right, it's 56 minutes past the hour. So let us review what we reviewed so far today. Let's look at this. Ba, ba, ba. So I can have all links for you. Our data sources, CDC, CDC, Our World and Data, or Oxford University. All right, we looked at basically going backwards. Penn State researchers came out with a pretty good, strong breakthrough on a wonderful medication. Same thing with Pittsburgh University of Pittsburgh. Links will be there for those wanting to follow through on that. Physical activity, yeah. Not much of anything going on, and there's to be a price to pay for that. Uh, they say, quote, negative effects similar to those observed in these studies should be avoided at all costs in future pandemics. Unfortunately, physical activity and exercise do not have a strong lobby and are usually neglected in public discourse. You can definitely say that again. Let's close all the gyms and lock people inside so they can't walk and do anything else. Draconian, bureaucratic, superfluous behavior. All right, methods extrait. A lot of individuals which are basically having uh, immune, immune, uh, immune issues uh, may not yield any benefit from the vaccine, it looks like. Uh, that's publisher bias, but we don't know until that's actually confirmed or denied. And it's something to look at. So if someone is taking methotrexate or other things uh, that basically has reduced immune response to the vaccine, uh, don't give them the false impression that the vaccine is protecting them. Help, help them be aware that they need to take other uh courses of action. Uh, Indipow Independent is our independent advisory committees in reference to mandating vaccines and things like that. Well, obviously they have a uh, honesty problem and when they get caught not being honest, they say it's not a problem. Yeah. All right. Assessment of basically the SARS reinfection after Lombardy, Italy. Very positive. If you made it through the first thing, uh, wave, uh, okay. It seems like you have uh, some sort of solid immunity. Um, COVID-19 reinfection rates are very low. Same thing here. Uh, so basically, you have three articles we had stating the reinfection rates are very low. Stay healthy. If you could, if by some odd chance you were fortunate enough to make it through, um, you can no one have to be as scared later on. It looks like. Uh, so on and so forth, good news again and confirmed over again. A lifelong, uh, you know, could give lifelong immunity. I don't want to say immunity, uh, lifelong resistance uh, as opposed to before trying to say it was three, four months or not at all. Remember that? Mass mandates, wonderful statistical analysis of the mass mandate information as reference to other states or individuals wear a mask, not wear a mask, so on and so forth. The mask thing has been a point of political contention. If they would not have the mask thing so much uh, or push so hard, I think you would have had stronger pandemic compliance in reference to social distancing and other measures. Because once you start telling people what they can wear and what they should wear, what they could do and who they could talk to and how they could sing and things like that and everything else like that and, you know, Remember, you couldn't even say hello to people, and two masks, three masks, astronaut helmet. It changes the whole dynamic. 
And so I'll have all the links there for you. Again, gratitude. Thank you for listening. I know it's been a long study. All the information will be there for you to, to review, and we will look at all this information later on, once again, next week, and see how it progresses. Gratitude to the researchers. Thank you very much for sticking with me through this whole video, and I'll talk to you all next week. Catch you then. Bye.